Hi, this is Nathan Murnack with Basecamp Country Real Estate. On this segment of episode 78, host of the Habitat podcast, Jared Van Hees, and national sales manager for Basecamp Country Real Estate, Tom James, talk through transplanting trees to enhance certain elements missing from their management projects. To learn more about the Habitat podcast, please go to habitatpodcast.com or find them on Facebook and make sure to give them a like. We thank you for listening in and hope you enjoy this segment. I, I was very intrigued about was the way that you, you you transplant different young trees, whether chestnuts or, or chicken pen oaks, or, or maybe you have other varieties as well. You, you start them in the timber and you move them out into the fields. Um, are there any other trees that you do that with or, or kind of explain quickly your mindset on that? Yeah. Okay. So I don't normally do that just every day to day, but okay. because of this, because of this introduction, and I, I, you know, I purchased the 23 to 2,500 um, oak saplings from the, the forestry department, planted those into the field and the project. Um, and I knew going into that, that I was going to experience a certain percentage of mortality. You just, you just know that you're right. You're not going to, every one of those is not going to live. Um, but in the weeks following the actual installation of those trees, um, while up at the campsite around around um, my camper and my fire pit and the upper food plots and our pond up there. Um, as summer wore on, I was looking around in the understory and we have this real beautiful giant chinkapin oak seed tree right there that just drops acorns everywhere. So I had just dozens and dozens of these anywhere from six, six inches to two and a half feet tall little chinkapin oak saplings that I thought, man, what, what better way I've got these right here at my, you know, at, 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 at my fingertips that I could grab these. So I went around and I took surveyor's tape and took a little, you know, a four inch piece of blue surveyor's tape and I tied it around each one of those little saplings so that I could identify them in late winter, early spring when the leaves were gone. And when they're um, dormant. yeah, when they were dormant, a couple of weeks ago, I went in there with a very uh, narrow, tall spade shovel, uh, like a tile spade and got down in the soil underneath them and worked way down below the tap root and shook them loose and lifted them up out. And basically I bare rooted them and um, filled a five gallon bucket up with those trees. And I, you mentioned the chestnuts. I did buy some improved chestnuts, some hybrid chestnuts that were um, in little peat pots, you know, so that I, they were probably two feet tall. And I, I took those, that dozen chestnut trees and those couple dozen chinkapin oak saplings that I had, you know, obviously those are native seed stock. They're right there from my farm on the soil that <laughs> that they were going to be basically planted back into while they're dormant. And um, it was just an easy, cool way for me to supplement what I knew I was going to lose in some mortality uh, in, in from the planting. And I went in and walked those rows up and down and I would stop every every so often and I would reach down and at a sapling that I planted last year. And if I could bend the tip over and it was flexible, that tree's alive. It's viable. It's going to come back. But if I reached down and I grabbed a sapling and I started to bend it over and it snapped off, that's a dead tree. You know, oh, so man. yeah, I would just stop right there. There's a perfect spot to replace one, you know, right. and right. Took, it took some time, but I had the data myself and I was just out there enjoying it and just taking those trees out of an environment where they may or may not have ever become, had a fighting chance to become a tree in, in, uh, in the understory up there to putting them out in, in the tree rows out in the open field and um, <laughs> God willing, give them a chance and maybe they'll avoid deer browsing and, and have a better chance to become a, a, a mighty oak one day out there in the, in the project. So, so here's a follow up question for you. My, there's a field I drive by every day when I bring my kids to school and there's a bunch of, of uh, young oaks and, and even some cedars out there real small. And, and the yeah. guy's a hay farmer. Yeah. So it's, it's on a steep slope of this hill. And and he doesn't he doesn't mow or, or plant that slope. I, I'm I'm gonna try to go ask him if I can get those trees off him and take them off his hands. Do you think do you think people think we're crazy for doing things like this by transplanting probably. trees from woods to field and back <laughs> and forth? Probably and, so. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the cedars though, because the actually the cedar trees that are in my um, project. I told you that we ordered 2,300 oak trees, but what I didn't tell you 
is that I hand dug 200 cedar trees oh, that were um, <laughs> six, six inches to uh, two feet tall. And no. I did that exact same thing. We, um, Zach and I took a couple sharp shovels and a, and a big tarp and we went down to a, uh, a roadside intersection. My, my, my younger brother is a, a, a private contractor and he, He's one of those guys that has the big fleet of tractors that with the 15 foot bat wing mowers and mows up and down the highways. Oh yeah. Oh, and yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. so he has, he has these contracts and um, in, in one of the areas that he mows not too far from his home, there's this big common like clover leaf area. That's got a lot of uh, basically it's just a pasture in there with the hillsides on the, on the side of the overpass are just absolutely covered with these young cedar trees. And every couple of years they get mowed, mowed off. So I know that the state doesn't want them there. They're just, they're causing them just a maintenance issue. So I went down there um, last year, Zach and I went out there with our shovels and within an hour, we had a couple hundred of those things dug up, bare rooted and wrapped tight in that bur in, into a big uh, a tarp. And by golly, those things got intermixed in within the planting um, when we, when we did the oaks and um Man, I probably just made he people's heads explode because yep, you're going to hear guys from, uh, let's say, the hilly country of Missouri say, "Why in the world would you ever plant, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, cedars in your in your oak stand?" Yep. Well, we're we're trying to recreate a brushy field habitat situation. We do not have a problem with cedar trees overtaking a stand here. I mean, I, sure. in my in my 120 acres, I, I don't even know of one cedar tree growing. Maybe I can sh show you some old ones that died because they eventually got shaded out. But um, we are not in a situation here where, where cedar trees are rampant and taking over. So they're, uh, they're, they're just a, a missing component. They, Correct. I know that sounds, that sounds rare and weird to say that, but uh, I want some thermal and, and visual screening cover supplementing it as an evergreen within the brushy oak stand and trust me 200 trees in 17 acres in the middle you know well, of course the, the middle part i think i told you guys is five to seven in hardwoods that's that's nothing and most of those and i, I most of those will survive a, a, a portion of them won't um if i've got a, a cedar tree for every 50 oak trees by golly i'll i'll take it <laughs> Amen. I, I was wondering if you were going to catch the uh, the whole invasive side of things on that conversation. Uh, yeah, a lot of guys it, will will probably be shaking their heads at at this part, but at the same time, you know what? Where, where I'm at as well, I'm lacking thermal cover, uh, conifers, anything with with year round cover, and those things grow like weeds. And I could yep. use a few hundred of them. There's not one in my area, so you know, yeah. It, like you said, I I think. Uh, I think it's, it's something I'm gonna I'm gonna go for, and I just I wondered if if you had ever thought about that too. It's funny that you actually did it. <laughs> I I've done it many many times, and I can show you some now that I did back in, golly, all the way back to 2004, five or six that are, you know, 15 and 20 foot tall now that were exactly that. I dug them up out of a ditch or a fallow field that somebody mowed, and I transplanted them. And lo and behold, I gave them a fighting chance and they are, they're magnificent trees today and providing screening and thermal cover. So, uh, here, I, I, I we, we covered this in the, in the past conversation that I'm a landscaper by heart, my, by original trade. So, um, I can tell you this with all certainty is that if you, if you dig cedar trees, um, early March, we're starting to get to the point now. I mean, starting, you can still do it now if you can get them in the ground within the same day or two after you dig them. But as long as you keep the roots moist and get them and in, into the soil and that has some moisture to it, you'll, you'll still be okay. Ideally you would have done that a month ago. Yeah. Um, but it's still possible to do it now. And um, if you go out with the, with the, I would take, I keep referring to it as a tile spade. It, it, it's got like a, uh, a two foot long blade to it. And it's only about four inches wide. It's what we used to use when we dug uh, d ditches to put drainage tile in because they were narrow, but long and you could scoop out the soil, but in, in a narrow trench, those things are ideal for digging little sapling trees because you can get deep, but not wide. 
and and you, by the time you stick it in the ground, working your way around a tree, maybe you stick it and push your foot down six times, and you've made a complete circle around this tree and cut all the, you know, a, a nice clean sever of the roots that are going laterally, but you're deep enough down to get below that the lower tap root, and then pull the thing up, you know, by leverage, you can work the soil up and then pull it up out of the ground and shake the soil off and stick it in a bucket. And now you've just exposed those roots to air. So you got to be very, very, uh, uh, you know, attentive to that. You got to be conscious of the fact that you've exposed those things to air. The less time they're exposed to the oxygen, the better because they will dry out and then you start reducing your chances of survival. So the more trees you can put in that bucket and they, they sort of shelter each other out from the wind and the sun and the, and the moisture uh, loss, but then if you're going to take them home, I would either throw some shredded newspaper or some peat moss or some mulch or something in there and spray some water in there with a, you know, with a, with your hose. You don't need to fill the bucket up with water, but just keep those roots moist. And if you can get them in the ground within the next few days, if you can't get them, uh, maybe it's the, the following weekend or whatever, as long as you keep them out of the sun in the garage or in the barn, keep them cool and, and keep those roots very very moist you you'll be able to make them survive when you when you put them back in the soil okay so what's your main cutoff date if you had to cut, put a date on this for michigan pennsylvania indiana our area of the world i'd say you're two weeks above me or behind me i would say for me probably in about two more weeks so probably by the end of the month of april for you guys okay you know by then you're pushing it quite to the extreme um, but you still haven't, those, they haven't full blown, just exploded their buds and really took off, taken off growing again. Yeah. They're just sort of in that they're ready to go, ready to go and just starting to swell buds. And, um, no doubt about it, it will be a shock to the system, but those things are tough trees. They're so man. resilient they, they, though. They, they yeah. really are. They really are. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. I think, I think, uh, you can't even kill those darn things if you try and you cut them down. So that's, yeah. <laughs> 